on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Hallfields Presbyterian Church where we build, grow, and share. We do have bathrooms in this place. They are located next door in the fellowship hall and behind us in the education building. That's where you will also find our nursery. Uh, we, of course, welcome our visitors. We are glad you are here. We do have cards available for you to provide us with contact information if you wish. Um, these same cards, however, can be used by anyone to make time with any of the staff, including myself, um, or to give us prayer requests. All of these same activities can be done using our church app. Just download the app, tap the connect button, and then you'll see all the options for you. This is Palm Sunday. And it's the beginning of Holy Week and the road leading to Easter. And it's admittedly a lot of church. It is. However, um, it's also the time that we set aside each year to journey closely with Jesus and to meditate on the sacrifice that he has made for us all. And so this week we will celebrate the Last Supper with Monday, Thursday um, at 7 o'clock where we will also be washing feet. I encourage you to come to this intimate service. Also, Good Friday is where we will spend some time focusing on the death of Jesus Christ. Um, we don't talk about it a lot, but we really should spend time with it uh, because it helps to accentuate the real sacrifice that God made on behalf of us all. Then, of course, we'll have the um, sunrise services at 6.30, followed by a breakfast put on by the Presbyterian men, and then we will have um, our Easter services at 11 o'clock and at 6 o'clock um, p.m. Again, it's a lot of church. I'm not saying you got to do all of it. I'm obviously going to be there for all of it. But if you'd like to join me, I'll be glad to see you there. So keep all that in mind. Um, the Presbyterian women continue their campaign with the chicks and bees. Um, I really encourage you to consider this and to give whatever you can to this effort. Um, every cent goes to helping families and communities come right out of poverty, and it works. Pepper International is a reputable organization, and again, their model has been done all over the world. So I encourage you to check them out um, and to give as you can. The Mission Yard Sale was fantastic. It was just this past weekend, and we have many thanks to Sam Jenkins and to Joe Covington for coordinating the We started our yard sale with prayer, so let's end it with prayer. Pray with me. Thanks to the Lord for everyone he called to help with our mission yard sale and with our bank sale. Thanks for the workers. Thanks for the donations of both sellable items and money. Thanks for the people in our community who bought the merchandise. Thanks for the yard sale success to the tune of $4,018.85. Amen. Amen. I, I just want to repeat what Sam just said, because I want to look at you with my eyes open and say, thank you is not sufficient. For all of those of you who brought stuff, who bought stuff, who worked, the ladies who did the bank sale, I just can't say thank you enough. I wish I could name you all, but I would forget somebody, and that would be good. So thank you very, very much. And let's get that name. That's good. Thank you very much. Very good. And thank you both again. So we began our Lenten journey together talking about food and using that as a metaphor for how we um, feed our faith. And we started with baby food and our need to grow in our faith. Then we talked about processed food and the need to have authentic faith. And then after that, we got into fast food and the idea that we need to take our time growing our faith. And then last, then we next talked about home-cooked food and the familiar comfort that our faith can bring. We ended Lent by talking about gourmet food and the need to pursue excellence in our faith. Today, again, we celebrate Palm Sunday and God's offering of Jesus' body and blood. So join us for the procession. Hopefully everyone has received a palm. If you haven't, raise your hand and we'll make sure one gets brought to you. Um, I will tell the ushers that I didn't get a palm, so 
I'm going to steal one from you. Um, but if you, today, again, we're going to celebrate together the triumphant entry of Jesus Christ. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to process. Um, we're going to have you stand when the time comes and um, follow the choir as they make their rounds. And then after you come around, place your palms either on or before the communion table. And then you can return to your seat. Thank you very much. Um, so after the scripture story is read at the start of our processional, again, bring your palms forward, waving them high, and place them in front of or on the communion table. So with that, let us hear the scripture of the palms. This is Luke chapter 19, verses 29 through 40. As Jesus came to Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he gave two disciples a task. He said, go into the village over there, and when you enter it, you will find tied up there a colt that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If someone asks, why are you untying it? Just say, its master needs it. Those who had been sent found it exactly as he said. As they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they replied, Its master needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their clothes on the colt, and lifted Jesus onto it. As Jesus rode along, they spread their clothes on the road. As Jesus approached the road, leading down from the Mount of Olives, the whole throng of his disciples began rejoicing. They praised God with a loud voice because of all the mighty things they had seen. They said, Blessings on the King.
And we do this because we remember Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And in the manner in which he came in. And, and anyway, so we, we celebrate. What made today's travel for Jesus different from when he went to Jericho City? Okay. Um, hey, y'all. Seriously, what, are, do we need to be here for this conversation? What are y'all doing? Um, yeah, actually. Why are these people so excited about Jesus on this day? I mean, he's been doing ministry for a long time. Turning water to wine, healing people, teaching for like three years now. What made them so excited today? I mean, they didn't get excited when he fed 5,000 or killed a blind man. What's up with the day? So we do this to honor Christ and to acknowledge what is coming later on this week with Monday Thursday and Friday. I don't Friday. Think that. They're doing it to honor Christ. But my question is, why now? What made these people get excited about Jesus on this day? You know, I tell you what, why don't y'all come up here, all right, and we'll look at it all together. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we gather for worship, isn't it? Sunday after Sunday, when we're together, we learn about God better. And so that's why, in our tradition, um, we typically will use worship. I don't know why. Um, as a way, again, to think more about God and to, and to learn together. Now, one of the things that we do in our tradition is we say a prayer of confession before we, at the beginning of worship, and it's to help open us up to hear God's word. And so, let's do that first, and then we'll be ready to hear the story and to maybe answer your question. Is that all right? So let us pray the prayer of confession together. Holy God, we have heard your story before. Help us not fall into the trap of parents. Thinking that you have nothing new to learn, or that we already know what we need to know about you. You make all things new, Lord. And our story will be that way for us now. Amen. Now, another thing that we do in, in our tradition is we say a prayer for illumination, which is a fancy way of saying, okay, God, help me understand this. And the reason we do that is because if this is God's word, then we need God's help. So, again, before we get any further, let's pray again together a prayer for illumination. After that stuff. Lord God, on this day we celebrate. Open our hearts and minds to see your salvation from creation to the arrival of Christ in human history. Let us hear your story to change the world and make us change the age. So when we we're talking about um, Palm Sunday, we were first talking about Jesus, right? And this man from Nazareth who's been going from town to town telling people about God's love. And for many years now, the leaders of the Jewish people, um, the Pharisees and some other groups, have taught them about God from the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible. Um, they call them the books of Moses. These are stories about our history, the wonder of God creating the earth, and about the faithfulness of Abraham and Sarah, and God calling out to Moses. Hey, I know about Moses. Yeah. He was the one that talked to God through the burning bush, and God told him to go back in and rescue all of God's people from Pharaoh. Egypt. That's right. And then when they left Egypt, they went through the Red Sea, and then they got to Mount Horeb, and they were given the Ten Commandments. But all of this happened, right, through Moses. And they believed that Moses had a direct line to God, a personal contact. And it gave everything that they believed about him a lot of weight. And so when Moses was told by God to go into Egypt, and then the Jews were um, enslaved and then freed, this was as real to them then as it was back in the day when it happened. So what does that have to do with Jesus? Well, okay, so God used all kinds of people over the years to speak for God and to remind the people about what God demands and what God does. In fact, the Pharisees also taught that the arrival of God's people in the promised land was something that God arranged. Um, they taught about God's laws or how people should live together, the proper foods to eat, um, how to prepare them, what to do if you get mold in your house, how to deal with infection, the Ten Commandments, I mean, all kinds of stuff. And the stories talk about the times when the Hebrew people cried out for judges and for kings to rule, like Joshua, Deborah, um, Gideon, um, Saul, and of course, 
King David. Yeah, he was the one who came after Saul. That's right, that's right. Um, the prophet Samuel was told by God to find the next king, and Samuel was told to look, um, was told what to look for, and it wasn't David's older brother. In fact, let's look at 1 Samuel um, 16, um, verse 7, see what it says. But the Lord said to Samuel, have no regard for his appearance or stature. God doesn't look at things like humans do. Humans see only what's visible to the eyes, but the Lord sees into the heart. All of these judges and kings were great leaders um, who were also sinners. They were sinful people that God used to lead the Jews through difficult times. And the Pharisees used these stories of these past leaders um, to inspire and to instruct. So in addition to the judges and kings, they taught about the prophets. They taught about Jonah running from God's message of mercy and compassion. Esther and Daniel standing up for God in spite hey, of their fear. Esther. Elijah. Yeah? What, what um, do you remember about Esther? She married a king, um, and she ended up talking to him and convincing him not to kill all her people because he was going Yeah, to that's right. But there was this deal, right, where um, <laughs> no one could approach the king unless they had permission. Otherwise, they were in pain of death. And when word got out about this scheme to destroy all the Jews, her uncle tried to convince her um, to go and have a conversation with the king, like you said. And she didn't want to go. And he says, look. How do you know that God hasn't brought you into the palace just for such a time as this? So she had to be brave, and she went anyway. And that, that's why she's a hero in the faith. Um, this saving history, God raising up people to be brave on behalf of the nation, is more than just stories. It's a way of life for the Jews. And we hear it not just in words, but also in song. Listen to this. <laughs> Thank you. 
so far away from God that just like Adam and Eve got kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Remember that story? Yeah. Remember that story? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, God's people got kicked out of the promised land. They went into exile. God used people to get out of Israel out of a lot of different kinds of trouble, but this was impossibly bad. The people felt like God was through with them, and though the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah tried to give the people hope, they still lost heart. And Isaiah talked about another person, an anointed person sent by God, a Messiah that would come to save the people. Right? Here, let's read this part of Isaiah. Um, a child is born to us, a son is given to us, and authority will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be a vast authority and endless peace for David's throne and for his kingdom, establishing and sustaining it with justice and righteousness, now and forever. The zeal of the Lord of heavenly forces will do this. Wait a minute, that's like the song you sing, Prince of Peace. Oh, well, that's right. You remember how that goes? The chorus? It goes, um...
They were tired of hurting, being beaten down by the Romans, being beaten up by their own leadership. And then comes Jesus. I mean, he talks to them. He talks like he really knows what he's talking about. He tells it like it is to everybody he meets, and yet there's no mistaking his ministry of love and the forgiveness of God. Between the healings, the feedings, breaking the rules of the Sabbath, even turning conventional wisdom on its head, Jesus was remarkable. And even before raising Lazarus, sitting there right outside of Jerusalem, the capital city and the people of God, <coughs> Jesus knew that it was time to go in, time to go in and die. You see, entering Jerusalem on that donkey, it was a provocation, a way for Jesus to say, yes, I'm the king you've been looking for, not, not on a horse, which was a mode of war, or a symbol of war, but on a donkey, a symbol of peace. Here, read, read this passage from Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Sing aloud, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king will come to you. He is righteous and victorious. He is humble and riding on an ass, on a colt, the offspring of a donkey. Yeah, so what about the colts? Uh, okay, okay, so earlier in Israel's history was this event called the Maccabean Revolt. Okay, the Maccabees were a prominent Jewish family, and they led the people in an uprising against the rulers who were over them at the time. And it was a great time of celebration of Jewish liberation. And part of the celebrating was done with palm branches. And so here you have the people watching Jesus come. They put two and two together and erupted with joy at the idea that the king had finally come to free them. And after everything Jesus had already done, right, all that stuff that you were talking about earlier, they really believed it this time. But if that's the case, then why was the Jewish leadership telling Jesus to make his disciples be quiet? Well, because there were still people who didn't believe. And there were people who were so scared of the Romans and what might happen. And so they didn't want to upset the balance of power as they understood. And look, I love Jesus' response to them, right? He says, even the stones would shout. You remember that? Do you know what that was about? Salvation doesn't, doesn't just come to us. It comes to everything, to all creation. We come full circle with Adam and Eve from the very beginning with a God who saved them and taught them how to farm and to the God who now saves us. And this is why we celebrate Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. And this is why we sing. Let us stand together. And so let us give 
not from obligation, but as we feel led. Let us give as the Spirit directs. <laughs>
from the tone of your conversations, it seems that we, like our forebears, were in need of Christ. So along with much of what you've already said, and of course the prayer list that is before us, let us pray together. Holy God, you have heard us. You always hear us. And now, oh God, we ask humbly that you empower us to hear you. Help us to see you. Help us to understand the advent of your coming. Help us to understand and to appreciate your choice to enter into Jerusalem willingly, to suffer so, and to die for us all. Lord God, as we seek to follow your example, help us to understand that what it is we are after is your grace, the love that you sought to teach us, the peace on which you rode in the hearts that were not at peace. And so, God, we pray. We pray that we not miss your entry this time. Maybe not into Jerusalem, but certainly into our lives. Help us to observe all the places where you are at work and where you are reaching out to us and drawing us in. Helping us to be a part of the kingdom that you are building. Help us indeed as we pray to be change agents with you in a world that desperately needs the Savior that you offer. You hear all the reasons, O oh God, and you certainly have your own. Reasons that you spell out so plainly in your word, that you love the world, that you gave your only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That you sent Jesus into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Thus he rides. And thus we should welcome him. And so with the symbols of these palms, and with the attitudes of our own hearts and minds, O oh God, help us to welcome you. Help us to make the path easy for you. Help us to accept you. We pray this not only for ourselves, but for so many that we can name, including our staff member of the month, Ricky Lee, for Carol, who continues to recover from her surgery and is making great progress, for Gloria, and her family as they walk with her in these, um, in these last moments. For Eric, as he continues to improve, as well as for Katie, whose progress is slow, but keep up her courage. We also pray, continue to pray for Jim as he recovers, and for his wife, Jewel, not only as she continues to serve with us, but also suffers from her back that's ailing her. We also pray, O oh God, continually for Dot and are grateful um, for her recovery that seems full. We also continue to pray and give you thanks for Jen, who's making great progress from her brain tumors. We also pray, um, continue to pray for Catherine and are grateful um, for her progress. We also pray for Woody, who had to briefly go into the hospital um, with... Um, with his blood getting too thin. We just pray that that got regulated and that he's on a better footing now. We also continue to pray for Millie as she recovers from her dehydration. We also continue to lift up Pat and we pray for the family of Craig Wallington. Wallington. Lord, we also pray for the family of Donna Rice and for the family of Patricia Sawyer. We continue to lift up Kim, Kimmy, and are glad that her ankle is so much better. We also continue to pray for the woman who came in in need of prayer. You know her, O oh God, and as well as her need. We also lift up Brandon to you, who continues to be in the ICU in Fredericksburg. We also pray for the family of Beth Adams. We lift up Lynn to you, as well as the people of Syria and this most recent chemical attack. Lord God, we also pray for Mary, who's in rehab, as well as for Debbie, who's facing stage 4 pancreatic cancer. 
Lord, we pray for Carolyn and her bone cancer, as well as for Jean, who's got stage 4 lung cancer. And we lift up Rhonda to you, who is awaiting results from her own tests. Lord, we pray also not only for our church, but for, but for believers everywhere, as we celebrate this day, this Palm Sunday, and again, your entry into Jerusalem and into us. All of this we pray in the great name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And so on this um, a bit unconventional Sunday, but nevertheless important Palm Sunday, let me encourage you, um, before we sing at the end, to remember that Jesus enters Jerusalem willingly for our sakes. In a long line of people that God has raised up to save the people, God offers us the body and blood of Christ. And so my brothers and sisters in Christ, let us feast on the peace that God offers, and celebrate the coming of the King, not just in the capital city, but the coming of Christ into us all. And so as you do so, may the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds this day, this holy week, and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Get up and take heart. Jesus is calling you. Let us stand together and celebrate the King. Amen.